I want to put this uh, biblical truth on the table, and then we'll uh, do something with it. Now, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work but trusts God, to justify the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. That's, that's pretty amazing. So, God justifies the wicked. And then, Abraham is a model for us, against all hope. And notice that language of against, against all hope. Abraham, in hope, believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. We are his offspring. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact, he did not deny reality, he faced the fact that his body was good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. So I want to I wanna interact with you this morning about trusting God when your body says otherwise. And I want to start by looking at this. Uh, these are questions that I gathered from another church, but I want you to know something about this church. This particular church that I got these from, I, I just, I raised the question, I said, you know, if you could ask God anything, anything that you wanted, what would you ask God? And, and the church where I asked this question was a church of about 350 people, and the church was known, they were widely known for being very accepting. They had a deep appreciation for grace. It was a place where a lot of people went who were wounded and went as a second chance. They were known for that. And so keep that in mind as we look at what I received. How can you love a sinner like me? How can you continue to love me? How can I overcome my worst enemy, that is, myself? Am I going in the direction you want me to go for myself and my family? Oh, dear God, please help me. I'm so aware of what a sinner I am, but I trust your grace. Will you please help me? How, Lord, how can you, how, Lord, can you continue to love a screw-up like me? How can I know you haven't given up on me since I myself would have given up on me. I would not take from somebody else what you have taken from me. They went on. How can I overcome the lustful desires that keep returning even when I put them away with your help? How can you love sinful mankind when we can be so cruel? What areas of personal study and development and living as a Christian in the body of Christ am I out of balance in? Why do I feel like my prayers are not always answered? Why is it so hard to feel that I'm in a saved relationship with you, God? How do I justify my divorce to my family, my job, to my friends? Why are you so hard to detect? Why do you do things the way you do? Do you accept me? Do you care about me? Are you pleased with me? Now, again, you know, it's one thing if I get these questions when I ask 100, 200, 300 people. I say, if you could ask God anything that you wanted, these are the kinds of questions that I would expect to get. But I wouldn't expect it from a church that prides itself on being focused on grace, love, acceptance, second chances. This is the place where you can come and belong. A church, in many ways, sort of like the spirit of Rimmel. And I, I think it all really sums up. When I listened to everything that I collected from this group, 
It's like, do you accept me? And it really is embodied by this one question that one person, one person just put it perfectly. And the question is, how are you doing down here? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to ask God, God, how am I doing down here? You know, give me some insight. Give me some feedback. You got any advice? I mean, what do I need to be doing? How am I doing? So that raises a little question for me, and that is, look at this with Rimmel. This is a church committed to helping people be set free. You don't deny the difficulty in my anguish, a recognition that things are difficult at times. But in my anguish, I cried to the Lord, and he answered me by setting me free. That is the message of Rimmel as a church to other people. You think about this, our mission is to nurture and equip the saved while reaching the lost as we honor God, share Jesus, and are led by the Holy Spirit. And our verse of our motto is Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. And this is the idea that we recognize that God can do more than we imagine. He can do more than we think. And so our imagination needs to be exploded into another dimension. We need to imagine greater things because God is greater than our imagination. So, so Rimmel, you as a church, it is very important to you, very important to you, that you communicate to other people that there's hope when they don't think there's hope. That whenever you face despair, it's not over. That when it looks as though you've blown all your opportunities, there's another chance, there's another possibility. There is hope no matter what. Even in the face of death, there is life again. You want people to feel like and to know that God will accept them no matter where they're at. That's very important to you. So my question is, how are you doing in believing what you tell others? How are you doing in believing the message you give others for yourself? That's a pretty good question. And that's what I want to zero in on this morning for this message. Now, we struggle with this uncertainty. How am I doing down here, Lord? I struggle with this uncertainty, and I do a couple of things because of this uncertainty, because I, I am insecure. I'm not sure what God really thinks about me, and I know I can read the Bible, I can listen to people I respect, but, you know, really, I want him to come down here where I can touch him. I want to hear him. I want to see him, and I want to say yes or no. You're doing good or you're doing bad. I want clarity. I don't want to have to have ambiguity and try to figure this out. And guess, I want to understand this because it's really what ultimately matters. And he just doesn't do that for me. So I wonder, how am I doing? And in my uncertainty, I tend to deal with this in one of three ways. It's by external behavior, internal feelings, or I compare myself with other people. Those are all wrong-headed directions. But here's one of them. Externally, you know, it's summed up whenever you think about the Pharisees, whenever Jesus described them in Matthew 23, he said, everything they do is done to be seen of men. Everything they do. See, it's behavior. You know, I know I'm doing all right down here. Why? Because of what I do. I go to church. That's a behavior. I read my Bible. That's a behavior. I prayed for... 30 minutes straight without a break. <laughs> and, and that's a behavior. That's something I do. And so as long as I do these things, I say, I'm doing all right down here. These are behaviors. Uh, Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 6. He says, the Pharisees, you fast. And that's a behavior. You pray. That's a behavior. You give. That's a behavior. But it's all empty. It's all empty. And the behavior, I can do the right thing and still be wrong. That's what hypocrisy is. Hypocrisy does the right thing for the wrong reason. I act like I'm something I'm not, but in the act, I'm at least doing something I ought to be doing. And so we, we deal with this by trying to shore up our behavior. And if I could just do better behavior, I'd feel like I'm doing pretty good down here. Internally, my feelings. You know, if I could just feel it. Now, this is speaking about a passage in John 
uh, 1 John. In 1 John, that whole letter is written for one reason, and he tells us what it is in, Matthew, or in uh, John, 1 John 5, 21. He says, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you might know that you have eternal life. In other words, he's writing 1 John. The reason 1 John is written is because people don't know they have a solid relationship with God, and they do. They're worrying about something they have no reason to worry about. And that whole letter, the purpose of that letter is to calm our hearts before God. That's why he says in 1 John 3, 18 to 21, whenever, and this is a powerful, powerful insight, whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. Sometimes your heart talks to you and your heart condemns you and God is greater than your heart. And then the comparison. You know, I look at who I'm around, and so as long as I'm doing well compared to these people next to me, or I'm doing better than you, or at least in the same range, then I feel like everything's good. And it's just, it's just a, a wrong path. It, it, it does not give us what it is we're looking for. Now, why is it, why is it so difficult? Why is it so difficult? For us to believe the hope for ourselves, we try to give to other people. These are ways that we try to deal with it that don't work. But there's a reason it's difficult for us, and I'll give you two. There are two reasons. One, it's difficult for me to believe there's hope for me because I know things about me you do not know about me. I know what I say to other people and about other people, and I know what I say about others and myself and even God that never comes across my lips. I know the inner thoughts of my own heart. I know what my eyes see in my own fantasy world of make-believe that you don't know. I know things about me that you have to be me to really know and it's not all good, even if I act like it is. And so because of that, you see, I can look at you, and I just look at your facade and their behavior, and I think, well, you're not as bad as me. But every person has something that has a rotten core that's gone bad. It was good. It's in the image of God, but it's gone bad. And so that's in all of us. But I know things about me you don't know, and that's why it's hard for me to accept that there's real hope for me. But there's another reason that's even more powerful, and that is we all know intuitively. We don't have to read the Bible for this, though the Bible does teach this. But we just intuitively know. When you're talking about God, think of, that, think of the word God. God is the being than which there is no greater than. God is the ultimate. God is God, right? I mean, when we're thinking about God, God has the standard of perfection. And I just know I cannot measure up to perfection. That's why it's so difficult for me to accept the hope for myself. <clears throat> Would you like to know how you're doing down here? <laughs> well, you know, I, I can tell you. I mean, of course, you'll evaluate and say, well, you did or didn't, but I think I can tell you. I think I can tell you how to deal with this issue. How are you doing here? And what you have to do is you have to change the question. Rather than raising the question, God, how am I doing down here? The question is not, how am I doing? The question is, God, how are you doing down here? If the question is, how am I doing, I, I can't ever work through that. But if I recognize he didn't come to make me a savior for myself, he didn't come to turn us into little saviors, that now he has given us a chance, he hit the reset button, and he's forgiven you from all of your sins, but you know instinctively that there was a reason you got into sin in the first place. And so even if you wipe my slate totally clean, 
And this is what happens whenever I get baptized. I feel so clean because I've had tangible evidence. I mean, there's water dripping off my body. And I'm saying, okay, you know, I, I am, I'm feeling it physically. I know that something's happened here. And so I feel so confident. Yet at the same time, ultimately, I, I get into this rut. And I know that even if you say, okay, everything, you're totally out of debt. Well, what got me in debt in the first place is still there. And I still find myself sinning afterwards. And so now what do I do with this? And I don't feel as close to God afterwards, after I've had some time. Why? It's because I continue in this path. And so, again, it's not that I need forgiven. I need power I don't have. I need deliverance. God didn't just hit the reset button and say, now I'm going to give you a chance and we'll see if you can save yourself. No, he is the Savior. I'm not. And so it's always an issue of how is God working with me? How is he doing in the work he's trying to do? Now, I just want to get at this by this imagery. Uh, have any of you ever felt, felt naked? You know, what I, you know what I mean by naked, right? Surely you've had those dreams, haven't you? You know what dreams I'm talking about? You dream that you didn't quite get dressed all the way, or you, you, you went naked, or, or you had your underwear or something, and, and you go, and everybody's looking at you, and it's, I mean, and you know, a friend of mine uh, ruined this for me. I, I had a, have a friend named Tom Taylor. I love Tom Taylor. He's a great preacher, minister, a pharmacist, great guy. Uh, but he said something once, and he's got some Tom's wisdom, and, and uh, we weren't just talking about naked people. I don't know, I don't remember why he said this, but it sure stuck. But he told me one day, he said, you know, Randy, do you realize that 99% of the people on the planet look better with clothes on than they do naked? <laughs> and I thought, hmm. So I was in an airport, and I was just waiting for my flight, and I was just watching these people walk. I just, I, th I put the Tom test. I wonder, would that person look better naked or clothes? Well, uh, more clothes. We need more than we got. Oh, a whole lot more than we got. Oh, now there might be an exception. Well, there's another. You know, 99%. You just think about this room. You just look around. <laughs> Dave? <laughs> you and I, man, we're going to be in trouble. <laughs> Most of us look better clothed than we do unclothed. And I, and I want you to notice that when you go back to the story of the fall, that's some imagery that the Bible pulls, and it uses that to say, let me help you understand what this is like. Because whenever God says to Adam, where are you? He says, we have hidden ourselves. We have been, we have realized we are naked. And because we're naked, we've, we've hidden ourselves. What does hiding yourself mean? Hiding yourself means I'm covering up my nakedness. Who told you you were naked? All of a sudden, I am self-conscious. Look at the nakedness of a little child who has no problem with that at all. They all look good naked, right? I mean, I mean you just look at the sweet, innocent little child, and they're not self-conscious about this. You and I, however, we've got something in this that makes it a little different. It's a little different. And you know the worst thing you can do is come to church naked. I mean, that'd be horrible. Not just because we'd think, well, you're a bad person, but we'd see how you look. <laughs> right? I mean, let's be honest. That's a part of it. And so, so this whole idea of being naked before God is the idea of being seen before God. And so clothing is a symbol. It's literal clothing. But it's symbolic clothing. What are the ways that I do things to make myself look like I'm something that I'm not? Really, we're all hypocrites. We all want to be something we wish we were instead of what we are, all of us. And as we struggle, we act like we are what we wish we were rather than who we really are. And so through this struggle, this is really getting into the sin issue. And so I'm feeling naked, and not only feeling naked, but looked at. But think about this passage that I've got quoted up here. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. We are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of us as have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been clothed with Christ. I'm clothed. I'm looking good because of my clothing, but I've got the clothing. 
And so now I am feeling before God desirable. I'm feeling good. Whenever I think about how I, I come at this, I, I've got to recognize that ultimately Christ is my covering. Christ is my dignity. Christ is the one that prevents me from being a person who lives in shame because of being exposed, not for something I'm not, but being exposed for what I really am. And in that kind of intimacy, there's, there's a cloak. He clothes me. He gives me something. Think about these passages. That God who made him who knew no sin be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God. And in 2 Corinthians 5, whenever you look at Romans 5, there is righteousness that is a gift from God. In 1 Corinthians 1.30, Jesus Christ is our wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. So, do you believe Jesus is righteous enough? Do you believe Jesus is perfect enough? Consider your baptism. Whenever I was baptized, I was baptized and it was a wonderful experience. But you know what? There wasn't an announcement on some loud speaker that didn't exist, some voice from heaven that said, Randy is my beloved son. When Jesus was baptized, that happened. Whenever Jesus was taken to the Mount of Transfiguration, whenever I think about my friends, there's never been a time when my friends have been with Randy and all of a sudden Randy glows. And when Randy glows, now... You look at him and this sound from heaven says, Randy is my beloved son. Listen to him. With Jesus, that's the message. This is God's son. Listen to him. Listen to him. And the reason he comes to the cross is not just because there's some legal requirement, though that's there, but it is also to reveal something. In Romans 3.31, Romans chapter 3, verses about 30 actually 23 to the end of the chapter there, he's talking about this as a revelation of a message from God, and the message is God loves you because you don't believe he does, because you know you, and you don't see why he would. And, and the cross is to prove. And it says, look at this. What does it take? What does it take for you to believe that I love you? It's not just about you. Consider your body. Consider your clothes. Consider God's eyes. Whenever I think about what God sees when he looks at Jesus, how does God feel when God the Father looks at Jesus Christ? That is how God feels when he looks at me. How am I doing down here? It depends on how Christ did on the cross. It depends on how God is doing as a Savior. How am I doing down here? It's all a matter of receiving that, not attaining that. And so, think about how you feel when you're looked at. Somebody stares. Think about how you feel when you're looked at and you're naked. And don't make this mistake. I remember an old man, an old man, and I, I say old as in early 80s, okay? His wife, late 70s. And as I go to have breakfast with them one morning, she says to her husband in front of me, she says, tell Randy what you said about me this morning when you bathed me. <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. I, I don't want to know what this 80-year-old man said to his 79-year-old wife when he bathed her. And why does she want me to know that? And it's like, oh. And, and she said, Randy, you know, I've got this shoulder. And I had this so shoulder operation. And, you know, so he, has to, he had to bathe me. And, and 
I just want you to know what he said. And he said, oh, I'm not going to tell Randy that. He's a preacher. <laughs> so, so she said, well, if you don't tell him, I'm going to tell him. And so I think, okay. <laughs> and uh, he says, I'll, I'll tell him. So, so she's, he said, Randy, you know, I, I, was, I was bathing her, and she was naked, and, you know, I, I'm not going to tell you what he told me. <laughs> <laughs> but it was good. <laughs> You're going to have to use your imagination. <laughs> but he told me, he said, I was caressing her. I mean, he, I mean, he really was graphic, but I think, whoa, I, I've never had a breakfast like this in all my life. <laughs> and, and whenever he finished telling me this, she looked at me and she said, Randy, when he talks to me like that, I know he's lying and I love it. I love it when he lies to me. <laughs> And I think, oh, but you know, he said, he said, you know, what she doesn't understand is I'm not lying. Now, think about this. Think about a 80-year-old man who has lived in such a way that he has seen his wife every day. It's like your children. You see them every day. You don't see them growing and you recognize they grew. And there was something, there was a beauty. I believe him. I believe he saw a beauty that if you just had her picture as a stranger naked on a magazine or a PowerPoint slide, we'd all turn our head. We would all turn our head. But I believe him, and I think he saw some beauty. And I think when God looks at us, even in our nakedness, because of what's happened in terms of our response to Christ and Christ's gift to us, he sees a beauty that we are actually, in some ways, ashamed of. Our weakness. What does God see as beautiful? The Bible teaches what is beautiful to God is a humble and contrite spirit. It's a trust. It's a confidence. It's a reliance. It's a willingness to risk. It's a willingness to be vulnerable. That is beauty. And when God looks at us and he sees that, he's not looking for people who can clean their own act up. He's looking for people who will have that vulnerability, that openness, that trust, that confidence, in spite of the messy mess. How are we doing down here? Well, I come back to this passage somewhere, well, back to where we started. Abraham, he looks at his body, and he looks at Sarah's body, and he says, there isn't any way... This is against hope. And that is, in fact, the point. We're doing quite well. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, that we are doing better than we think we are. I know as we uh, seek to encourage and lift other people up in our words, we actually talk about hope. And sometimes we don't even receive that much for ourselves but we think somehow it's available to others. Help us to see it's just as available to us. Calm our hearts. Help us to know that however we're doing, you are doing just fine. You love us. You are committed to us, and you will finish the work you started. No matter how hopeless, it looks to us, and no matter how much it seems, that we are traveling against hope. Hope itself will turn around, and we will be what you have called us to be. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.